In the 1990s, Ireland experienced its own mysterious vanishing triangle. On the eastern side of the country, women were vanishing without a trace. And if you join the dots of each place they went missing, you get a haunting triangular shape. Unfortunately, despite significant efforts and large-scale investigations down the years, we have not been successful to date. In a seemingly safe country, someone was out there, an unknown serial killer, and the mystery of these deaths still lingers on today. Annie McCarrick. Our story starts in 1993. Annie McCarrick was from upstate New York and traveled to learn more about her Irish heritage and take in the culture of her ancestors. She was just 26 years old and shared an apartment with two female roommates in Sandy Mount, an affluent residential area outside Dublin city center. Her mother was expected to visit her in the coming days. The first warning sign was on Friday, March 26th, when she did not show up to pick up her paycheck at work. On Saturday, she was scheduled to have dinner with friends, but did not show up either. Her friends were suspicious and had the telephone number of her father John. They called him from New York. John knew his daughter well and not turning up to things without any notice was unlike her. Something was up. He told ABC News she was always reaching out and touching someone. She would never have gone a day without talking to someone. We were very, very concerned. Instead of her scheduled trip to Ireland, Annie's mother got on the next flight over to Dublin and was accompanied by her husband. The American embassy recommended an investigator named Brian McCarthy would help find their daughter. The first thing they did was try to trace Annie's step on that day. Annie left her flat to walk the short distance to a supermarket in Sandy Mount, and her two roommates had left for the weekend. She purchased materials to make sweets for Cafe Java, where she was scheduled to work the following day, according to receipts time-stamped at 11.02 a.m. A witness claims to have seen someone matching Annie's description on the 44 bus. The final stop on this bus was a small town named Enniskiri, a town that Annie would frequently visit. At 9 p.m. that night, another witness spotted Annie at Johnny Fox's pub, which was just three miles outside Enniskiri, and just outside of the Wicklow Mountains. This pub was a popular spot for tourists, particularly Irish Americans looking to absorb Irish culture. According to Annie's friends and roommates, she was single at the time. However, she was seen in this pub with an unidentified man. Annie's parents spent six months in Ireland to search and find their daughter. They flew back to America and would never see their daughter again. The search continues. In recent years, Catherine Fagan wrote an article for the Irish Independent, pleading for anyone who knows about Annie's disappearance and mentioning that US lawyer Michael Griffith was a leading the investigation. Griffith appeared on Irish radio soon after with some positive news. I, want, I am pleased to announce within the last 15 minutes, thanks to uh, uh, Catherine Fagan's article, uh, I received an email uh, from an Irish citizen uh, with a very, very promising lead. But three years on from that radio interview, there has been no further information. Spanish media has also revealed that the notorious killer Antonio Angles fled to Ireland during this time. He hid on a boat traveling from Portugal to Liverpool and then jumped out into the Irish Sea. He was rescued by a boat approaching Dublin, but by the time they arrived at the port, he had escaped. But it is not clear how long Angles stayed in Ireland. Former FBI agent Kenneth Strange, who has helped with the investigation of Annie, refused to rule this out and said, I have reached the conclusion it's possible they crossed paths. Watching the news of Annie's disappearance in 1993 was an Irish woman named Colette McCann. Like everyone else, she watched the footage, felt sorry for the family, and never assumed something similar might happen to her. She said, I remember seeing her father on the television in Ireland, and I remember seeing the sorrow and the sadness and the anguish on that family's face, and I remember thinking to myself, God bless him. I couldn't imagine anybody going through that. But then it was a very short 12 weeks later that we were going through the exact same thing with Eva. Eva Brennan. A 15-minute drive from Sandy Mount is a place known as Rathgar, the place that Eva Brennan was seen. Eva came from a loving family, but Colette admitted that her sister Eva did suffer from depression. However, at the time of her disappearance, she was relatively happy and would not simply vanish from thin air. Let's put it this way, Eva didn't kill herself and bury herself never to be found, she said. She was a sociable person and would often visit friends and family. On Sunday, July 25th, 1993, she attended church at St. Joseph's Church and then walked to her parents' home in Terenure. They had dinner, but a minor family argument, as all families have, broke out, and she left. Their last contact with their daughter was over a silly argument about the food. They never saw her again. A curious detail is that Eva was wearing her jacket at her parents' house, and this jacket was found at her home, so she clearly made it back home. Like Annie, she had no boyfriend or partner at the time that anybody knew about. Eva was 39 years old when this happened. There was no investigation into her death until three months after she went missing, leaving the family to criticize the police force heavily at the time. Imelda Keenan. 
1994 was the first time when one of these disappearances happened outside of Dublin. 83 miles south of the capital is a small city named Waterford, and in an apartment along William Street lived Imelda Keenan. On the 3rd of January 1994, Imelda told her fiancé that she was going to the post office to collect a social welfare payment. She told him that she wouldn't be long, and also mentioned that she needed to get some cat litter. A witness, who knew Imelda, was driving along William Street and let her pass by. This was the last known sighting of this woman. One peculiar detail is that she disappeared on a public holiday so the post office would have been closed. It's unclear whether she realized this before she reached the post office, though. Her older brother Jerry has ruled out any possibility of it being a suicide. He said, Nothing I know about Imelda has ever suggested to me that she would have taken her own life. Jerry, to this day, maintains that there are people in Waterford who know what happened, but are withholding information. I believe that there are two or three people in Waterford holding back vital information who know what may have happened to her. They are walking around Waterford with this information, and all I can do is hope that at some stage in their life they come forward and give my family a little bit of peace. It's it's never too late to come forward with information. I'm not looking for revenge. The case is closed as far as I'm concerned. Josephine Jojo Dullard. 30 miles north of Waterford is a small village called Callan. This was where 21-year-old Josephine Jojo Dullard had grown up. After finishing school, she moved to Dublin, but often travelled between Callan and Dublin. It was travelling along this route that led to her disappearance. On November 9th, 1995, Jojo left her family's home in Callan at 8.30am to get on the bus to Dublin. She arrived in Dublin that afternoon and met some friends at Bruxelles pub on Harry Street in Dublin city centre. She intended to return home that night, but missed the bus back. Instead, she got the bus to the town of Nace and hoped to hitch a ride back from there. She arrived in Nace at 10.50pm. She hitched two further rides, which brought her as far as Moon, which was still about 30 miles from her home. The last reported contact of 21-year-old Josephine Dollard was when it's claimed she called a friend, Mary Cullinan, at around 11.15pm on Thursday last from the Kildare village of Moon. The last thing she told her friend was that a car was stopping for her. Jojo was never heard from again. Two motorists who'd given Jojo lifts in Nace and Kilcullen had come forward, but whoever drove her from Moon was unknown. They have chosen to keep that secret to themselves. Fiona Pender. Almost a year later, yet another young woman vanished off the face of the earth. 60 miles west of Dublin is the town of Tullamore, which is the most westerly point of the triangle, and home of 25-year-old woman Fiona Pender. Fiona was seven months pregnant when she was last seen. On Friday, August 23, 1996, she was last seen at her flat on Church Street at 6 a.m. According to Alan Bailey, the former sergeant in charge of the case, the killer knew Fiona. He said, As a result of my inquiries, I have no doubt that the person responsible for Fiona's disappearance was well known to her. Not alone was Fiona known to the person who caused her to disappear, but the fact that she was pregnant and just six or eight weeks from having her child would also be well known to the same person. One known suspect was considered by the police in connection with the disappearance, but this person was never found. They suspect that this person is now living in Canada. In 2008, something suspicious was found along the Sleeve Bloom Mountains, near the town where she lived. Planks of wood were hammered together in the shape of a cross, and written across it read, Fiona Pender, buried here August 22, 1996. It was reported reported in the news that no one knew whether it was left there in an act of guilt, compassion, trickery, or remorse. Whatever it was, it did not add any further information to the case. They did not find any remains around this location either. In September 2022, police were on high alert for this man, as one of the family members died, and they figured that he might try and attend the funeral. This person did not attend that funeral, which may be an admission of guilt. Kira Breen the northernmost point in the triangle is Dundalk, County Loud, a town north of Dublin. 17-year-old Kira Brown was the next person to go missing. On the 13th of February 1997, Kira was last seen by her mother. Kira was going to bed at 12.25 a.m. Earlier that day, she had dinner with her mother at a restaurant in Dundalk and watched the movie Bad Boys before going to bed. Her mother got up in the night and realized that Kira had gone from her bed. The window was left by the latch, leaving her mother to realize that she had snuck out the window, with the obvious hope of sneaking back in later that night. She never made it back to her bedroom. Like all of these girls, the police asked people with any information to come forward. Normally, this was met with radio silence. On this occasion, though, two anonymous letters were sent. The inspector at the time said, We did receive two anonymous letters. It said that we should talk to him, the prime suspect about it, that he knew something about her disappearance. The suspect was arrested in 1999, but no further charges were brought against him. Sixteen years later, in 2015, he was arrested once again. The detective said, He almost admitted it to us. When we arrested a second time, and we were interviewing him, and he was crying his eyes out and was down on his knees and just about to pop and tell us and his solicitor came in. He got a second wind and then said nothing to us. The same suspect was taken into police custody for something else in 2017 and died of a suspected drug overdose. The secret he was on the cusp of telling everyone is something he will take to his grave. Fiona Sinnott 
Fiona Sinnott disappeared without a trace over 19 years ago at the time she was living in a rented house in Broadway County Wexford with her baby daughter. On Sunday the 8th of February 1998, the 19 year old was socialising with friends at Butler's Pub in Broadway. She left the pub at around midnight. It was the last confirmed sighting of the woman. There are vague witnesses from this night. A motorist reported seeing a male and female on the roadway near Keisha Cross Broadway at around midnight on the night of her disappearance. There were also two male in their late teens to early 20s in close proximity. No person has ever been charged at the time of her disappearance. She was the mother of an 11-month-old daughter. The daughter is now older than when her mother's life was possibly cut short. Her disappearance was upgraded to a murder investigation in 2005. The police arrested one man on suspicion of her murder and four other people in connection with the murder, but pressed no charges. A 2019 TV documentary looked into Fiona's medical records and found evidence of domestic abuse. But with all of these cases, there was no conclusive person to point the finger at, Deirdre Jacob. Later that year, Deirdre Jacob, aged 18, of Newbridge County Kildare, went missing. She was studying in London at the time, but had come home to Ireland for the summer. She had gone down to the bank to get a bank draft to pay for her student accommodation in London. She also had paid a quick visit to her grandmother's shop during this errand. CCTV footage was even caught of Deirdre on this day, and this case was updated to a murder case in 2018. This was ruled out as a possible suicide. Not only was it out of her nature, she was also scheduled to start as a receptionist job in London and was simply going back home to visit her family. In October 2021, a new search went underway for Deirdre in places of interest, but she continues to be missing. And with 25 years now past, it's sad and unlikely that she will ever be found. But in 2016, both of Deirdre's parents suggested there might be a strong link between her death and a prime suspect in all of these murders. And the person we have to thank for giving us the best possible lead on this case and possibly preventing future murders is a woman known simply as Jill. Jill. Jill is a woman whose name has been changed to protect her identity. She is someone who could have been part of this dastardly triangle, but lives to tell the tale. On February 11th, the year 2000, Jill noticed a man pacing up and down in a car park, but before she reached the car door, she heard a sudden and authoritative shout, Give me the money! He punched her twice in the face and threw her into the driver's seat. Jill looked out into the car park and screamed for help. There was not another soul to be seen. He slammed her head and cracked her cheekbone. Jill's recollection was that he was good at doing this. He had clearly learned from experience. Experience. The man drove Jill to a secluded area, where he repeatedly raped and beat her. He then brought her up to Spinnan's Cross in the Wicklow Mountains and did the same again. This is the same mountain range that the first victim, Annie McCarrick, was seen near. At this point, Jill told the man, If you have a gun, use it now, because I can't take it anymore. In the early hours of the night, the man told Jill that he was not going to let her go. He took her outside the car and moved in to strangle her. He was about to take her life away, when a bright light shone in both of their eyes. Two hunters were out that night and recognized the man. He sped away in his car, and the woman was safe. Had they not randomly been out hunting foxes, she would not be alive today. The police arrested a man the next day. His name was Larry Murphy, the prime suspect. Murphy was sentenced to 15 years in prison. However, Jill noticed that he had clearly done this before, leading to speculation that Murphy could be responsible for these murders. When Annie McCarrick was murdered in 1993, Murphy would have been 27 years old. He is considered a person of interest in this case. According to a source from the Irish Independent, he is still a person of interest, but he is not the number one suspect anymore. It's fair to say that he is not on top of the list. Murphy is also a person of interest in the disappearance of Jojo Dullard. When Jojo traveled from Dublin to Callan, she was last seen in a place called called Moon. Murphy, at the time, was living in Castle Dermot, a town that was five minutes away. However, Jojo's sister disagrees with Murphy's involvement in this case. I don't think he is in any way connected with Joe's disappearance. When he went to jail, we were told he wasn't a suspect in Joe's case, and now we're led to believe by reading the papers that he is, but I believe he had nothing to do with it. The closest possible link Murphy has is to Deirdre Jacob. Deirdre was last seen when walking down the street to the bank, and CCTV footage showed someone who bared a slight resemblance to Murphy outside the post office. Detectives tracked down a number of Murphy's Murphy's colleagues in 1998 and got conflicting accounts of whether it could have been him. The police have receipts that prove that Murphy was in Newbridge doing carpentry work in a disco bar in July 1998, the very month that Deirdre went missing. However, they cannot find witnesses to confirm he was there, innocent till proven guilty. Murphy has been connected to these murders, but nothing was proven against him. He is innocent until proven guilty of all the murders. The only fact we have is that he was convicted for the rape and murder of a woman and lived within the Vanishing Circle, and the Vanishing Circle seems to stop 
when he was taken away to prison. Speaking about his attack on Jill, a retired detective named Mark Carroll said, He moved like a rocket, took complete control, and threw her into the car. You'd have to think it was planned and rehearsed. You'd have to ask, had he done it before? Murphy was released from prison in 2010, much to the outrage of the Irish people. His face is so well known across the country that he has had to live abroad. Larry's own brother said, There's no reason why my brother won't do it again. To me, it was the work of an animal. Another serial killer in Ireland at that time was Antonio Anglés. He disappeared in 1993 and was never seen again. The fact that the FBI are failing to rule out that he may have been in contact with Annie McCarrick means that he is also a possible candidate for these murders too. The circumstances. There are a number of circumstances that allowed something like this to happen. The most obvious factor is that these women did not have a phone in their pockets. The widespread use of mobile phones came to Ireland in the early 2000s, coincidentally when the vanishing triangle stopped. Within a matter of seconds, these people could alert their friends and family to the danger. Furthermore, there was also a culture of secrecy surrounding these murders at the time. Crime author Claire McGowan wrote a book about these murders, but despite having grown up in Ireland during the 1990s, she had never heard of these murders until she researched her book. During the 20th century, Northern Ireland was the scene of a horrific political conflict known as the Troubles, where violence escalated between the Protestant and Catholic communities. According to McGowan, I think partly the news was really dominated by the Troubles growing up in the 90s. I think a lot of what you might call ordinary murders, non-political murders, we didn't hear about them. I think that kind of fed into a perception that they didn't really happen in Ireland. It was a safe place to be as a woman if you were lucky enough not to get caught in the Troubles. Because of this delusional attitude that this did not happen in Ireland, the police were often not fully prepared for cases of this magnitude. It took months for the investigations of Eva Brennan to get underway. Annie McCarrick's parents decided to hire a private investigator instead of relying on the police alone. No single culprit. In terms of who could be the murderer, McGowan explains, in some cases there is an obvious suspect. Three of the cases there was a man in their life who became a suspect. Nothing was ever proved. What I've tried to do in the book is say, when you look into it, probably not all of those women were killed by the same person. But that's also an interesting story. Why, if there is an obvious suspect in a history of domestic violence, why was that person never charged? Why would the police then be like, oh, she's just disappeared, rather than her violent ex-partner possibly killed her? The most frightening thought for McGowan is that 17-year-old Kira Breen went to the same discos that she attended as a teenager too. These women were simply at the wrong place at the wrong time. While many people tend to victim blame women for not being careful enough while walking alone at night, several of these women disappeared in broad daylight. As well as these disappearances, there have been severe knock-on effects for the families involved. Fiona Pender's father, Sean, is believed to have taken his own life in 2000 and simply couldn't deal with the grief. For most of the families, the thought of even finding remains would at least know where they stand and provide some closure. The conclusion I come to is there probably was an unidentified serial murderer, but in some cases, the story is much closer to home and just a really sad, everyday kind of story. The sad truth is that all of these families might never get the justice that they deserve. The person or people who committed these horrible crimes still remains a mystery. The enigma and the vanishing triangle and the fact that none of these bodies have been found lingers on. Thank you so much for watching. Please click on some of the videos you see in front of you now for more. I'll see you there.